AK muscle imbalances contribute to degeneration. Muscle weaknesses create muscle imbalances. That causes altered ranges of motion and increased susceptibility to injury. When injury occurs, muscle imbalances due to weaknesses cause slowing of healing and produce increased pain and disability. So, <laughs> give an example of a knee problem. Sartorius, gracilis, gastrocnemius, adrenal stress syndrome related weakness and vast, uh, quadriceps weakness related to small intestine dysfunction, oftentimes with NSAIDs use, irritating the small intestine because the person's got a knee problem and they saw some guy running on TV with his buddy with his knee all taped up and how come you're running so well? Well, I'm taking some non anti-inflammatory drug and it's, I've been running fine ever since then after I had my surgery and yes, and you're going to end up creating that muscle weakness and perpetuating that quadriceps weakness and you're going to ruin your knee and have more surgery again later or eventually you'll be all set for a knee replacement. And, there's this degenerative process that people don't look at, but that's what happens. They take the NSAID drugs and it contributes to the whole process, as you'll see, in more ways than just creating the muscle weakness as we get along. Or low back pain, you have the sartorius gracilis muscles from adrenal stress strong causing the instability of the pelvis because of their attachments on the anterior superior iliac spine and on the uh, pubic area. And uh, so the pelvic is unstable and the TFL from the large intestine. So you get these muscle weaknesses and it's in difficult for the pelvic and low back to become stable from those things. And so we get these typical muscle weaknesses that people have relative to the organs which are under stress. Adrenals, small intestine, large intestine from dysbiosis or food allergies or non anti-inflammatory use or whatever. And this creates weaknesses which perpetuate the, dis, uh, the disability by causing instability in the joint and aggravates the pain and because of the instability in the joint, you slow the healing process. It's constantly under stress instead of being allowed to heal. So the effects of injury, the first slide, is injuries often occur from muscle imbalances and visceral and chemical imbalances. I'm sorry, injuries often occur from muscle imbalances which are secondary or due to visceral and chemical imbalances, as we know. Increased nociception from mechanical nociception from the inflammatory response and from proteoglycan breakdown products from cartilage damage, all bombard the nervous system with more nociception. Now, we didn't talk about this yet, but GAGs or proteoglycans, when they break down, their breakdown products actually can stimulate nociceptors. So that when there's joint damage, especially cartilage damage, the breakdown of that tissue actually adds to the uh, nociceptive barrage and then creates a furthering of the nociceptive withdrawal reflexes and the other downstream or upstream consequences of that that we talked about, including the autonomic effects and so on. And the increased nociception then causes vasoconstriction locally through the IML and the further muscle imbalances from the FRA responses. So if we want healing to take place, we want to get rid of that vasoconstriction, so we want to remove the nociception. It's good for the initial injury because it keeps it from bleeding to death, but then we want the circulation to come back for healing. Second slide on the same thing, effects of injury. Ligaments have a very large nerve supply, yet ligaments and cartilage have a relatively poor blood supply, and cartilage has a real poor blood supply. And so vasoconstriction following injury slows the gag synthesis and the healing of these tissues. And nostril anti-inflammatory drugs are often used inappropriately. So we have a vicious cycle of joint damage and NSAID use. Joint tissue damage causes inflammation and causes a gags breakdown. These all cause nociceptor stimulation, which cause muscle imbalance, instability, pain, drives the patients to use NSAIDs, and vasoconstriction, which is good at the initial injury but doesn't allow the tissues to heal properly. So this is the first part of a vicious cycle, which we'll finish on a later slide. You get the muscle imbalance, pain, and vasoconstriction. If we look at the muscle imbalance part, we get altered joint mechanics, which furthers joint damage, certainly slows healing, but also makes the person more susceptible to injury and, and actually can further joint damage, which feeds back into the beginning of this, of this vicious cycle. Now let's look at the adverse effects of nonsteroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, and we'll come back to the rest of that last slide in a moment. We got GI hemorrhage and leaky gut. The inc or increased cortisol DHEA ratio also interferes with gut mucosal function, causing immune system the gut to be compromised, secretory IgA is lessened, and mucosal integrity, leaky gut, is compromised as well. So the trouble with NSAIDs, this is from toreduce.org, each year 105,000 people are hospitalized with serious side effects from taking NSAIDs. Each year 16,500 people die from the serious side effects from taking NSAIDs. More people die from NSAID side effects each year than from AIDS in the United States. More than four times as many people die from NSAID side effects as from cervical cancer each year. And of course, every woman is supposed to get a pap smear every year to try to avoid cervical cancer, but, but people don't pay much attention to the 
emphasis on the number of people that die from NSAIDs, but a lot of emphasis, you've got to get your pap smear, but you've got to take your NSAIDs too. It doesn't make sense. You know, it's just, it's not logical. It's when people are trained and you're forced to be overwhelmed with the amount of material you must consume, you don't have time to think about it. We all get in those positions when we're in school. We're overwhelmed with the amount of material we have to digest to be able to take care of patients according to standards of care, and very few of us then, under those circumstances, would have time to stop and think about it. And in the medical profession especially, they don't have time to stop and think about it. And when they don't think about it, they don't see the idiocy of some of their standards of procedure. And they don't see the ridiculous imbalance between being very concerned about women getting cervical cancer, but giving NSAIDs which kill people four times as many times a year as the cervical cancer they're trying to prevent. I mean, if we look at these things logically with the big picture, it just doesn't make sense. And really, the story of the emperor has no clothes really comes to mind. Now, I'm not trying to be critical of medicine. I'm just trying to be critical of what happens in reality out there. Because we all need medicine. We all need it if we get an accident. We have to go to an emergency room. We have something that happens when we need surgery. Or sometimes we get something where we need a drug. We all have that potential, and it's, it's, it's got its place. So I'm not trying to be critical of it, but I'm trying to be critical of the thought process. No, not the thought process. The lack of thought process behind typical practice, which contributes to people's degeneration. And somebody's got to intervene, and we're the only ones who have the thought process, much less the philosophy and training and tools to be able to do it. So only one in five people who show serious problems from taking NSAIDs have warning symptoms. Next thing you know, they're in the hospital. So the adverse effects of NSAIDs um, are one of the things that happens, and it, four of those create muscle imbalances. GI hemorrhage, you're going to have irritation of the gastrointestinal system, you're going to have weakness of the pec clavicula, the quadriceps, the abdominals, maybe even as far down as the tensor fascia lata. The leaky gut, the same thing, especially the small intestine, so you're going to have quadriceps, maybe abdominal muscles weak because of the adverse effects of NSAIDs. And you'll see patients who have weakening on their quadriceps or abdominal NLs and stomach NLs sometimes as well, stomach Chapman's reflex, when they have been taking NSAIDs for a long period of time. Then you also get destruction of vitamin C and, antagoniz and, 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 and antagonization of folic acid. And the antagonizing folic acid and vitamin C cause more inflammatory activity in the gut and don't allow the gut to heal. Now the lining cells of the gut turn over every 24 to 48 hours. We get new linear lining cells of our gut mucosa. We get new lining cells of the, of the um, small intestine, the, the epithelial layer. And it sloughs off and we get new ones produced. And that requires folic acid, as any tissue does, to be reproduced. And in decreased folic acid availability, that doesn't happen, so the gut doesn't heal as fast. And so you get the effects of NSAIDs and folic acid is antagonized and the gut doesn't heal. And so we get even further uh, irritation of the gut and weakness of the quadriceps and the uh, abdominals potentially as well. We also have um, other muscle imbalances from vitamin C, all the shoulder muscles that we talked about, and also folic acid can be related to muscle weaknesses, you know, pretty much anywhere in the body. We saw yesterday a patient had, uh, what, three different muscles or four different muscles responding to folic acid. So these deficiencies contribute to muscle weaknesses and create these muscle imbalances that perpetuate injury or set us up for injury in the first place sometimes. And certainly perpetuate injury or slow healing. So this adverse effects of NSAIDs, four of them actually make significant muscle imbalances which can slow the healing process of the injuries in that area. So let's go back now to this other part of this slide, the vicious cycle of joint damage and NSAID use, and we see we get the first top half of the slide, and then we get to the bottom half with muscle imbalances and, and the altered joint mechanics. But if we look at the fact that the nociceptor stimulation causes pain, then the pain comes down in the middle there and causes NSAID use in so many, I mean, it just, it shouldn't, but it does. It should cause fatty acid use, but it causes NSAID use and chronic NSAID use. And so NSAID use causes muscle imbalance then, which feeds back into the altered joint mechanics like we just talked about. NSAID use also decreases gag synthesis, and we'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. It decreases the synthesis of our cartilage, which oftentimes is the area that's injured and needs to be healed. And so we end up getting more joint damage, and it creates, again, this vicious cycle. So other adverse effects of NSAIDs are slowing fracture healing. These are slides, actually Phil Maffetone got these slides, me speaking of Phil Maffetone recently, and that show the effects of NSAIDs in bone healing. And this is normal healing of the bone here on the left when there's no drug. And we see after, I forget how many weeks, it, there it is, two weeks, 
three weeks and four weeks. We see the fusion of the bone, the healing of the bone taking place. With endomethacin, these are all NSAIDs here, endomethacin, we see the healing is nowhere near as complete or nowhere near as good. We have a little healing going down here, but it hasn't really healed back together all the way through as it has here. And we get with um, celecoxib, which is Celebrex, um, or rufocoxib, which is um, uh, Vioxx, right? Vioxx? Yeah. And you see the disruption of healing of the bone in two, three, and four weeks here. So if there's ever a fracture, you don't want to be taking these things. And that's what everybody does to try to cut their pain down, is take these things. And it actually slows the healing. Now this is in animals, but presumably the same thing is in patients as well. And uh, there are studies to try to find that out that I believe are ongoing. So here are the references. These are from 1998 and uh, 1996 and 1995 and 1990 respectively that talk about uh, bone healing. And, uh, and this is, these are all in rats and the adverse effects of NSAIDs on bone healing. So we can talk about blocking GAG synthesis. And what happens with the adverse effects of NSAIDs, they really decrease availability of sulfate. And that interferes with GAG healing. It also has other effects on sulfation, which we'll talk about. So the necessary uh, importance of sulfate is necessary for cartilage production and repair, and also liver detoxification, which we mentioned. We'll talk about a little more later. But the importance of sulfate for cartilage production and repair is as follows, it relates to this as follows. The NSAIDs decrease the availability of sulfates and interfere with GAG synthesis. This is a 1990 reference and a 1992 reference, and I believe these were in dogs, but I think the same thing has been shown to be true in humans. Um, and these are, are um, uh, studies which show that the sulfates are dramatically decreased after NSAID use and the circulation in the blood is dramatically, the levels of circulating in the blood are dramatically reduced for availability for any other purpose, including GAG synthesis. And they actually showed in these studies not where the sulfates just decreased, but the GAG synthesis was, was interfered with. And so sulfur is also necessary for liver detoxification of steroid hormones and aspirin, acetaminophen, and ibuprofen, as we discussed. And so we have the liver detoxification phase one and phase two. Now, um, the phase one and phase two pattern um, in the middle is the free radical production. These patterns are, are um, stressed by the NSAIDs and deplete especially phase two sulfation activity. So there are a variety of reasons for endocrine gland recurrence that could be, as we talked about in diagnosing the process, too much or not enough of a hormone. And you can have too much because the body's either making too much or what? It's not breaking it down enough. So when we have excess hormone synthesis or decreased liver breakdown, we still get hormonal imbalances. We could also have problems where there wasn't enough synthesis or too much breakdown, which doesn't happen too often. But we have oftentimes when there's not enough synthesis or too much synthesis of the hormone and or not enough breakdown. And so again, cortisol upregulates phase one and stresses the levels of sulfation which for which we can screen with cysteine or other sulfur products and glucuronidation. And so once again, we see the cortisol affecting these detoxification pathways, the mixed function oxidases that we talked about previously. So again, phase one, phase two ratio, increasing the phase one, two, phase one to phase two ratio creates halfway detoxified substances which are often more toxic than the original substance. And the increasing of free radical activity also causes increased antioxidants needs. So when we drive the body for higher levels of detoxification, we pay a price for it. And this again occurs when phase one pathways are induced to increased activity, such as in high cortisol and stress states, or in phase two substances that are not available, such as in endocrine system hormones, uh, sulfate depletion or glucuronic acid depletion. Five of the 10 phase two detoxification pathways require sulfate. One is sulfation. Two is methylation, which uses the sulfur amino acid pathways that we've talked about, methylation down into homocysteine and then recycling back into methylation, giving and taking a methyl group along the way. Glutathione conjugation, which is a molecule which contains cysteine as well as glycine and glutamic acid, and cysteine then is a sulfur molecule, has an active role in the glutathione molecule. And then acetylation uses acetylcoenzyme A, and coenzyme A is the um, coenzyme form of panathenic acid or the activated form of panathenic acid. And Panathenic acid uses or a sulfur molecule to become coenzyme A in its activated form. 
And then there's conjugation with taurine. And if we call the secondary uh, pathways, the phase two pathways, and we can't classify them as if there are 10, and use taurine conjugation as one, and glycine conjugation as one, and a few of the amino acid conjugations as individual ones, then we add taurine conjugation in there, um, and we uh, get five of the 10 pathways that are dependent on sulfur. And so we could also, sometimes people say there are six pathways, and the sixth one is amino acid conjugation, and it lists several amino acids. But if we break it down and put all 10, we separate taurine out, and we get, uh, we get five of them requiring sulfur. So again, the liver detoxification, five of these phase two pathways are going to require some sulfur molecule. So when we get the antioxidant depletion from excess phase one activity and possibly poor diet, we get inflammatory activity and um, nociceptor stimulation and pain, which causes people to take NSAIDs. The NSAIDs then further deplete the sulfate, which causes increased liver detoxification stress. And also, the stress on the liver causes more antioxidant depletion, which then causes more inflammation, more nociceptor stimulation, and more pain. And we get a vicious cycle of antioxidant depletion taking place. Now, this doesn't take place in every patient or every time, but these are the things that we see, if you think of it, in a lot of patients, if we actually step back and look at what's going on in their long-term care, these are the individual pieces of the puzzle for individual patients. Some have all of them, some have a few of them, but these are the vicious cycles they get trapped into. And somebody's got to intervene and train them how to take their lifestyle into their own hands and also treat them to get them back on normal and to provide the substances they need to do so. So here are the whole adverse effects of, of uh, NSAIDs all in one slide, slow fracture healing, GI hemorrhage, leaky gut, vitamin C decreased, uh, create muscle imbalances, decrease sulfate and decrease gag synthesis, interfere with folic acid and, and also leukotrienes. And these are all the things that happen from the adverse effects of NSAIDs. They really should never be used more than two or three days. In fact, um, when I was in, uh, uh, the, there was an Olympic Sports Festival medical conference when they had the Olympic Sports Festival in uh, Raleigh and Durham, Chapel Hill area, uh, back in like 1987 or something. And even back in those days, uh, there were some studies that were done by orthopedic surgery staff at Duke University, Bill Garrett and, and his colleagues. Um, and they showed that the NSAID use was very useful for the first two or three days after injury two or three days, and then it wasn't useful anymore. And how many people do you know take it for two or three days and stop? You know, it's the chronic use that's the problem, not the acute use. And if the patient's fatty acids are good and you use proper pain relief techniques, you'll usually cut down the inflammatory process and you won't even need them at all. So, decreased availability of sulfate. Sulfur loss from incre increased toxic load to the liver causes a uh, uh, low methionine, cysteine, and glutathione, which causes the decreased protein synthesis. Now, protein synthesis depends on amino acid availability. And amino acids uh, have to be necess are necessary for synthesis of proteins, which usually contain multiple numbers of amino acids, sometimes all of them. And a protein will be produced to the limits of the limiting amino acid. So if there's a, Boku amounts of all the amino acids, but there's not very much methionine around. If you've got 100 molecules of all the other amino acids, and you've got 10 molecules of methionine, and, and you require one molecule of methionine for each protein, you're going to make 10 molecules of the protein. That's it. You won't make any more. So if you don't have an amino acid, and the protein requires that amino acid, it stops its production when you lose that, use up that last bit of amino acid. 